Welcome to today's program. My name is Glenn Deason. I'm joined by Alexander Mercurius from the Duran. And our guest today at uh, UN in New York is uh, Dmitry uh, Polyansky, who serves as first deputy permanent representative of Russia to the United Nations. Uh, welcome, sir. My pleasure. Good to see you. Yeah, it's a great privilege to have you on us. Uh, I think most people are very unfamiliar with Russia's position. I always said that, at least during the Cold War, we have, were familiar with Moscow's perspective. But these days, there's very little understanding, uh, largely because of the censorship of Russian media. But also, from, from personal experience, I can say any efforts to even explain Russia's position can very easily result in censorship and cancellation. So I think uh, it's a great privilege and opportunity to, for people to become more familiar with the uh, Russian perspective. So uh, we have a few topics we re really wanted to discuss, so I thought we'd just jump into it. Uh, we can start with, yeah, I guess, the most pressing problem, which is the conflict in Ukraine, as, uh, well, diplom diplomacy obviously uh, has failed completely, you know, resulting in war and uh, little efforts to end it. I was just wondering, how, how did we end up here? And uh, uh, how do you see the undermining of uh, diplomacy? And uh, as all path to peaceful resolution been exhausted at this point? Well, uh, Glenn, you're absolutely right. Uh, diplomacy has failed, and you know that uh, there is a rule. Then uh, when diplomats uh, stop talking, then the military men and the cannons uh, start speaking, and that's what we see right now. I think uh, that this crisis was looming for many, many years, uh, evidently, at least from the illegal uh, anti-constitutional coup uh, in Kiev in 2014. But uh, my perception is that it started looming even, even earlier than this, when it was absolutely clear that the West, and in particular the United States, are, are keen to make uh, Ukraine a tool of their geopolitical game against Russia in their efforts to weaken Russia. And uh, now they speak, uh, at least not so loudly, but they used to do it quite recently. They speak about inflicting uh, strategic uh, defeat on Russia, which is, of course, uh, wishful thinking and uh, absolutely futile exercise, but they haven't uh, given it up completely. And Ukraine had a very serious role to play. But it all started, uh, in my perception, Back at the beginning of the year 2000s, maybe, uh, I can recall uh, the famous uh, Vladimir Putin's speech in Munich in 2007, uh, where he act actually highlighted uh, all the dangers that we're facing right now. He uh, made a very clear warning and a very uh, clear picture of our position, of our approaches, of our red lines. One of our red lines, of course, was the encroachment of NATO uh, to the east. Uh, we were absolutely vocal about it from the outset. It's not that we started to speak about it uh, recently. No, that's not true. We were speaking about it even in the 90s. Even Boris Yeltsin was not happy about this because he was aware of the of the promises that were made uh, to Soviet leaders and to Russian leaders uh, about the fate of NATO. Actually, what was on the table at that time was some kind of a new security architecture for the world and for Europe in particular where NATO, as far as I can guess, uh, was uh, destined to become part of a bigger organization, bigger structure, something like OSCE Plus, uh, where Russia would play uh, an equal role uh, and uh, would have a stake in this common European security. And this, is an, a very, this was a very understandable concept, very logical, after the end of the Cold War, when the Warsaw Pact was dismantled, and it was absolutely clear that NATO doesn't have any more the adversary. And actually, when the Soviet leaders were acting in good faith uh, by dismantling Eastern Bloc, uh, they were also accounting on the adequate response uh, from the West. But uh, the West uh, was only paying lip service to this, but it never did anything concrete. NATO continued to expand. Russia's interests uh, continued to be ignored. There were attempts of interfering into Russian internal politics. Uh, it's enough to recall the conflict in Chechnya. Uh, what was the West, Western role behind this conflict? We all know about this. So it came to the moment when President Putin in 2007 in Munich made a very clear warning to the West that if we are heading this way, then we will have inevitably problems. And then it all started, you remember, about Georgia. 
about Mikhail Saakashvili, about uh, all the things that happened afterwards, several attempts in Ukraine. And uh, on top of this, of course, is illegal Maidan coup in 2014, when uh, the uh, pro-American uh, Kiev regime was installed uh, and absolutely sacrificed all the country's national interests for the sake of uh, U U.S. Uh, geostrategical and geopolitical interests. So we were warning about the fact that the crisis is about to become very hot. Actually, it was very hot. It was hot in the east of Ukraine. You remember that uh, Kiev regime started so-called uh, counter-terrorist operation, which was in fact uh, the attempt to uh, to exterminate dissent at the east of the country to uh, to make those who who were not uh, agreeing with the new regime uh, to make them shut shut up. And it was done with the help of uh, arms, with the help of tanks, with the help of uh, bombs. And uh, they have been bombing uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, Donbass, uh, for eight years uh, before we started our special military operation. Mm -hmm. And we made several attempts to bring the situation back to the to the peaceful route. And uh, you remember Minsk agreements, Minsk 1, Minsk 2. Minsk agreements, as many people accept right now in Ukraine, was the best chance for for this country to reunify. It was a clear path, what to do, how to do it. And it was nothing extraordinary. It was no capitulation of Ukraine. It was just the uh, a number of actions which is normal for, for any democratic uh, free state. They, sh they just needed to give to the people in the east of the country the same rights as to the, to the others. And these rights uh, included uh, the right, of course, to, to speak their own language, to give education, to their children in their own language, uh, to retain their cultural and historic identity. So I don't think it's something that is extraordinary in any democratic world. Look at, I don't know, look at Belgium, for example, look at Switzerland. Can you imagine that one part of Belgium, like Flemish part, would be oppressing French part, saying that they are not capable of uh, speaking, um, not eligible of speaking their own language? What would be the reaction in Paris, for example, or other countries, or Switzerland? Uh, and it's even more than this. Uh, if you look at Ukraine, you will see that even today, uh, almost virtually every Ukrainian speaks Russian. And majority of Ukrainians have Russian as mother tongue. Mother tongue. Mother tongue. So you can imagine the scope of all this uh, madness that is being happening in Ukraine, all this oppression of Russian-speaking population, all, this, all these attempts to kind of exterminate their own identity, which has always been interlinked uh, with, with Russian identity, to put it mildly. Some people would say that it's even the same on their identities. So uh, we warned that this crisis was looming when uh, the West was absolutely sabotaging the implementation of Minsk agreements, when um, Kiev regime said that it will not go, it was not going to implement uh, Minsk agreements, and when Zelensky hinted that Ukraine is, uh, is about uh, to think about uh, acquiring nuclear weapons again. And that was, of course, something that we couldn't tolerate. We proposed uh, draft treaties on uh, European security to NATO and to the U.S., but they were condescendingly rejected. Uh, and um, then I think that it was the only way for us to, to proceed. It's what not, uh, it was not our choice. Uh, we are not happy about what's happening. It's a big tragedy for, for both countries, but it's the only way to solve this problem once and for all, and uh, it's the only way to chase the uh, United States and its allies uh, away from this from this territory. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, what's my perception, and uh, maybe we can discuss some more details. Mm. Well, thank you for that. Can I just say that the whole idea of trying to inflict a strategic defeat upon Russia seems to me to be uh, so astonishing and so incredible that if American spokesmen had not been actually speaking about it, including the American defense minister, I could not have believed myself that such a strategy would be adopted by the United States. But it was. And I think there is now a general understanding in the United States and in Europe that this policy has failed that there has been this attempt to do that and it was unsuccessful. And now we sense that there is attempts to try and find some way of ending the war 
in a way that will enable the United States to claim some kind of victory out of it, to preserve face. Now, I was reading today a very interesting interview that your foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has been giving, which he discusses some of the recent messaging that we're getting from the West. There's also been suggestions that the Russians are actually seeking a ceasefire. There was an article to this effect in the New York Times. Can we? Can you just set out for us what the Russian position is about talks at this time? Because this is something I think that there's a lot of un- misunderstanding about. And if you could clarify what the official Russian position is on talks, that would be really helpful. Well, uh, first of all, I need to say that uh, these speculations about the fact that Russia is uh, seeking some some backdoor agreements on ceasefire have been already rejected by, by Dmitry Peskov, the spokesperson of uh, Russian president. Mm. This is, of course, a wishful thinking. This is something that maybe the U.S. is promoting, but we are not paying very much attention, frankly. This is a U.S. problem. They have started this whole thing. They now maybe uh, uh, speaking, th- thinking of some kind of exit strategy, some kind of, of off-ramp, as they say here in the United States. But it's their problem. It's their headache. Uh, we uh, formulated from the outset uh, the the goals of, of our special military operation. Uh, demilitarization of Ukraine and denazification of Ukraine were two uh, among them. So the demilitarization, I think, uh, this aim was almost achieved. You see now that uh, in, uh, in reality, no matter uh, how uh, boastful the Ukrainian politicians could be, in reality, they can't fight without Western weapons and Western uh, assistance. And this has been acknowledged uh, these days. There were several statements from Ukrainian politicians uh, saying that if the, if the Western support is not there, then the Ukraine will not be able to withstand even for several days, will not be able to, to pay salaries uh, to, to public, uh, per public, first public servicemen. What is it? It means that there is a regime which has been uh, propped up by the West, financed by the West. This regime has already squandered several armies of ammunition. And now this regime, like like a drug addict, is not capable of survival without uh, without uh, life-saving assistance of this, of this type. It means that this is 100% Western project, supported by the West, financed by the West, and fighting for Western interests. That's what we were warning from, the, uh, from day one. So uh, we, again, from day one, of our special military operation, we were saying that uh, we are not rejecting negotiations. That was our position. It remains the same uh, as as per today. It means that if there is a serious approach from the part of, of Ukraine of, and its backers to uh, so to um, implement our the goals of our special military operation by peaceful means, then we are ready to sit and discuss. But uh, there was a, a very uh, memorable uh, situation, and it's now being a, an important po- point of reference for many people. It was the negotiations in Istanbul and in Minsk in April uh, 2022, immediately after the beginning of our special military operation, when our troops uh, penetrated uh, quite deeply into Ukrainian territory. You remember that they were near Kiev. And then the negotiations uh, were conducted quite successfully, and there was a draft deal initialed in Istanbul. It means that there were it was it wasn't signed, but it means that the negotiators at their level had referendum adopted this kind of arrangement, and it was up to Kiev to take the political decision and to sign this treaty. The treaty was ad- ad- advantageous for Ukraine, and it was not recently uh, acknowledged by one of the participants, by Ukrainian diplomat Chali. Uh, there, were, there are also a lot of testimonies from different politicians that uh, Ukraine withdraw from these negotiations, uh, well, let's put it mildly, under the influence of, of the UK and the US, which somehow uh, managed to convince uh, Zelensky that he's capable to win uh, with the help of Western weapons. And he made this absolutely foolish and fatal mistake to reject the deal that was on the table and to uh, uh, to start fighting Russia seriously with the help of Western arms, counting on the Western support. Maybe he was having in mind the situation that the West will 
introduce uh, its own troops uh, to Ukraine. I don't know what he was calculating. It's, it's his problem. But in reality, he absolutely missed this uh, best chance for peace ever. And uh, I, I need also to remind to those who are watching that now, now Ukraine is boasting, for example, that it has pushed our troops from Kiev, uh, and uh, there was kind of a battle for Kiev. But let's let's recall the situation: the withdrawal of Russian troops from Kiev, from from I would say thirty percent maybe of the territories that was taken in the first days of the war, was a gesture of of goodwill, and it was announced like this: that because of the progress at negotiations to show our goodwill, we are withdrawing from Kiev, from Sumy, from Chernigiv, and from other regions. Now they are presenting this as a, as a strategic mistake for Ukrainian troops. It was not. They were absolutely uh, surprised by this move, and they were not even believing that it, this was serious. And they were, of course, incapable of fighting back with um, with their military force at this moment. But nevertheless, our troops were withdrawn uh, back to, to our frontier. And what happened then? Ukraine rejected, uh, not only rejected the uh, negotiations, but also President Zelensky... Uh, in uh, in the fall of last year, adopted a decree through Verkhovna Rada, the parliament, which literally prohibits him of entering any negotiations with current Russian government. It means that any any negotiations, any speculations about negotiations um, from the part of Ukraine are mere lip service because they can't enter into any negotiations with Russia with this bill uh, being in force. And uh, Western commentators uh, quite often try to omit this deliberately, saying that there are no serious Russian proposals uh, for negotiations. Well, there was one in uh, Istanbul, they rejected it. Now everything that we heard from Ukraine was kind of ultimatum. Russia is returning back to the frontier of 1991. You shouldn't forget about about the fact that, that there are our people living there. These regions have made their choice to become part of Russia. Uh, Ukrainian regime was warning about some kind of guerrilla warfare that will start there uh, after, as they put it, Russian aggression. So what kind of guerrillas are there? There are only Ukrainian sabotage groups which are being penetrating uh, this territory and is being discovered by local population, which is quite loyal to Russia and which is absolutely not willing that Russia leaves. Uh, this territory. And also in the uh, bordering areas, it's also quite obvious that the support towards Russia is uh, is too high. Ukraine is trying to do something to evacuate these people forcefully, uh, but they don't want to leave. They are waiting for Russian troops to arrive. That's the reality. So how can we abandon these people? How can we just trade them off and saying that, guys, you know, it's happened like this, that uh, because, of, uh, because of Zelensky regime, uh, we want to to give you back to Ukraine, and you will uh, again be assimilated uh, forcefully, and uh, all your rights will be uh, violated and breached uh, by Kiev regime, and we will just sit there idle and uh, look at what's happening. How how can we do it? The the any kind of uh, deal uh, should encompass uh, several points. It's quite clear. So denazification is one of them. We don't want. To have at our borders a state which praises um, uh, Hitler collaborators as, as heroes, Bandera and Shukhevich, people who have blood on their hands, uh, blood of uh, Jews, Russians, Poles, Ukrainians, by the way. How, how can we tolerate this? We, we will not tolerate this. If we can achieve these goals through negotiations, if we can achieve the goal of Ukraine being neutral and not uh, threatening us anymore from its territory and pursuing the policy that would answer to the interests of Ukraine and not to the interests of the United States. I can't exclude that there, there might be some kind of a deal, but I don't see it coming and looming at all. And I can assure you that at least from the UN perspective, many people think that something maybe is happening at the UN, uh, kind of backdoor negotiations. Nothing is happening there, nothing. We only uh, sit there in the Security Council chamber and are trading barbs and uh, they are being absolutely delirious about describing the situation, uh, not mentioning the Ukrainian representative who is absolutely crazy and russophobic and has been so uh, even before the start of our special military operations, not helpful at all. So nothing serious is happening in the UN. I'm not aware of what's happening elsewhere, but I don't see any, any signs of this. Uh, so 
as far as as far as the waning of Western support is concerned, well, uh, we're keeping champagne on, on ice, of course. So we hear all these reports, but uh, it's not that we will just, you know, uh, stop uh, our uh, uh, military operation, which is now in a very very active phase, and you know that our troops are dominating almost everywhere, and there have been very important territorial gains uh, which are being ignored by Western pre press recently, and I think it's only the beginning. So we can't stop it and say, okay, guys, let's sit uh, empty-handed and wait when Ukraine collapses. I, I, I am absolutely sure that uh, that in January there will be some kind of a deal in the Congress, there will be some kind of the arrangement, and there will be more uh, lifeline of, uh, of, of, of help uh, approved by by Ukraine, but it will not change the situation drastically, because the uh, the level of support to Ukraine, which it saw recently, was absolutely uh, unprecedented, and it didn't help this country uh, to 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 withstand. And uh, so it will only uh, make its end uh, more uh, tragic, uh, more I don't know. It, it will bring more suffering to to the Ukrainian people, uh, but it will not change the course of history. And uh, uh, well, I think that again, it's my perception that we can compare the situation in Ukraine now in the situation with with Nazi Germany, let's say at the end of uh, 1943, maybe beginning of 1944, when the Soviet army was already on the borders uh, of, of of Soviet Union, pushed away uh, in most uh, situations on uh, Nazi troops. Uh, but uh, Germany, instead of surrendering and saving a lot of lives uh, and uh, contributing to establishing uh, some kind of security system in Europe, Germany decided to sacrifice its, its whole population. And Hitler was absolutely misleading their own public. Uh, a lot of Germans after that um, were, uh, after the victory uh, of Russia, were... Uh, very much, uh, I would say, devastated by the news about concentration camps. They said that they, they are not knowing about concentration camps. I think that this, in the same way, a lot of Ukrainians will be devastated by the news of what's, what really happened in, in Donbass mm -hmm. during these eight years. I'm sure that many of them are not aware of this. They are absolutely brainwashed by the propaganda. So now the Zelensky regime has the same choice as, mm -hmm. as uh, Nazi Germany back then, uh, mm -hmm. to stop it and to save a lot of his countrymen, or to sacrifice almost everybody, and of course to sacrifice the future of of, uh, its, of his country. I don't want to speculate here, but I think it's it's obvious to everyone that this is a moment of truth and destiny uh, for, for for Ukraine right now. And you you see right now also how common Ukrainian citizens are reacting to what's happening in the country, how enthusiastic they are in terms of fighting for Zelensky regime, uh, in terms of this conscription, which is being called conscription, conscription to the grave in the country. You mm -hmm. see how, the long queues of Ukrainians trying to get their passports and all the documents before this uh, law on uh, forceful mobilization enters into force. This is the most important thing. This is the decisive factor, the level of support, and not the uh, amount of arms delivered or not delivered, and uh, money delivered or not delivered. So mm -hmm. It's absolutely playing no crucial role. It will delay. It will delay our victory, but it will not. Uh, um, it will not, do not derail it. So, that's my perception. I want to just switch gears uh, to um, another war, which is uh, in Gaza. Uh, of course, uh, Russia has an uh, important voice there as well. I was just wondering, what what is the diplomatic maneuvering, or what are the main challenges uh, for a ceasefire, uh, the way you see it, and uh, what is the stand of Russia? Well, there is only one obstacle for the UN and for international community in this situation, and this obstacle is the position of the of the United States. The United States is covering its uh, strategic ally in the Middle East uh, at any price, at the price of its own reputation. The US has already used veto three times in the Security Council, showing that they are not ready to accept any kind of product, any kind of Security Council resolution which would compromise Israeli plans on the ground. This is quite obvious. So the latest situation, which was, uh, I think, uh, last week, when we agreed to resolution number 2720, uh, we uh, tried to introduce there an amendment, which was vetoed by the United States on clear, with a clear demand to humanitarian ceasefire, because that is the thing that is being most 
needed on the ground, and it's not our opinion. It's the opinion of Secretary General of Humanitarian Agencies. It's quite clear that it's impossible to deliver humanitarian assistance and to help those in need in Gaza when there, mm-hmm. there are hostilities on the ground. But the U.S. Uh, introduced very sly formula, which is about a need to create conditions leading to the uh, sustainable cessation of hostilities. Can you imagine how tricky this formula is? So, of course, it's being interpreted in Israel that what, what it is doing, it's, it is creating conditions for, for sustainable cessation of hostilities. And uh, we uh, absolutely, from the outset, uh, uh, exposed this, uh, this uh, sly thinking behind this amendment, and we would have vetoed this draft, but uh, Arabic countries were asking us very much not to do it and uh, to abstain because uh, the second part of this resolution implied a very serious um, humanitarian uh, delivery aid control mechanism. But uh, we are very skeptical, frankly, uh, because, uh, again, this mechanism will not work without a ceasefire. That's quite clear. There is no mechanism that would help no, no humanitarian mechanism which will help uh, Gazans on the ground when they are being shelled and killed in such in such big quality quantities yeah. and numbers. So absolutely, uh, the work of uh, Security Council is paralyzed because of the United States, because of its veto, and the U.S. is absolutely isolated in terms mm-hmm. of Security Council. I think even the U.K. is not is not ready to follow uh, the U.S. in this case. And if you take the wider uh, UN membership, you will see that the latest resolution of the General Assembly uh, got 153 countries supporting mm-hmm. it, and only a handful uh, opposing, uh, like 10 countries, uh, most of them very close allies of the United States. This is this is a very deafening isolation uh, mm-hmm. on the international arena that the US is facing now in the Security Council. And of course, they are very much interested to change the situation, but so mm-hmm. far, they are not interested, they are not capable of doing anything that would pre- pre- prevent Israel from implementing its, its, its aims in Gaza, unfortunately. We, we, we're coming up, I, th- I think, to our time. If you will allow me just one further question, which is about mm-hmm. the fact that you mentioned that the United States, that there's no, in, there's no secret diplomacy going on between Russia and the United States at the Security Council. We've heard the same thing, by the way, from others, that there is, in fact, no secret diplomacy of any kind going on between Russia and the West. But what about your partners, the BRIC states, which is a subject we become very interested in? I mean, at the Security Council, do you work closely with the Chinese, the Brazilians who are now on the Security Council? Do you meet with their teams? Do you discuss uh, resolutions together? Do you work on resolutions together? Is the is the sort of that kind of coordination taking place uh, at the present time with within the BRICS, um, you know, working at the Security Council? Because we have been impressed, uh, uh, the two of us, by how actually how effective a lot of the work in the Security Council and in the General Assembly has been since the start of the Gaza crisis, despite the fact that there is this obstacle with the United States? Well, of course, we have a very uh, high degree of coordination and uh, we have a lot of like-minded states, uh, especially on the Gaza issue in uh, in the UN and in the Security Council. That's absolutely clear. And uh, it's not only the BRICS countries. Uh, there are a lot of other countries who clearly understand that uh, the, the real intention of the U.S. and Western uh, foreign policy in this region, they also see the, the blatant uh, double standards uh, because what's happening in Gaza, if it's compared to, to the Ukraine, to the situation in Ukraine, uh, well, the, the, the striking difference is quite obvious. Uh, there was a piece of news recently that uh, at the beginning of the crisis in Israel, uh, the hot stage of the crisis, about 4,000 Ukrainian refugees decided to return to Ukraine, saying that Ukraine is much safer than Israel, not Gaza, but Israel. Can you imagine uh, all these uh, absolutely uh, absolutely false uh, narratives that the West is being promoted about uh, the cruel character of our war against civil civilian population? We were saying that we are targeting military infrastructure and, uh, and sites linked to the potential military and industrial potential of Ukraine. It's quite clear that uh, in in terms of Ukraine, the Western countries are crying wolf, 
in terms of uh, in terms of, of Gaza, they are absolutely silent. They are not calling for Security Council meetings. They are not exposing the atrocities that Israel is committing there. That they are quite happy, let's put it this way, to any condemnation of Israel's action. Yes, their position is evolving, but very, very slowly, and I would say uh, absolutely unwillingly. So these double standards has pushed uh, a lot of our colleagues to better understanding the the position of of Russia and aligning with Russia and uh, even in the Security Council uh, when we supported when we proposed this amendment on on ceasefire we got the immediate support of 10 Security Council member some members something that was absolutely unimaginable uh, several months ago and uh, a lot of countries from the global south are now understanding quite better uh, our reasoning behind uh, this confrontation with the west provoked by the west and we see it uh, in the Gazan crisis um, in the, the most vivid colors. So the West has shown its true colors in, in Western crisis. Now they see its true colors on, also in the crisis uh, in Ukraine. And uh, that helps us to coordinate, that helps us to uh, formulate our positions. And uh, again, uh, the West is very much isolated, especially the United States now in Security Council and in General Assembly. I think that, Ambassador, because you've, you've you've been very generous with your time, and I know you're excited. Always busy. maybe last last more que last question, and then I will I will go on question. Right. Okay. Well, I guess uh, yeah. My 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 question would be: given that uh, the West and Russia has this conflict, uh, which has escalated to this extent, uh, what is the state of diplomacy at the moment? Uh, is can you reach any common views on even basics like international law, or is there any uh, how 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 do you see the the main challenges there at the United Nations? The main challenges is that everything that is linked to legality and everything that is linked uh, to international law, international humanitarian law, in case of uh, of Russia Ukraine conf conflict and uh, actions of Kiev regime is being thrown under the bus. That's the problem. Uh, and uh, again, it's also obvious in in terms of Gaza. This is undermining very much the position of the of the West, uh, the promotion of so-called uh, democratic values that the West is trying to do. You also uh, mentioned, Glenn, at the beginning of our conversation, the absolutely outrageous situation with the freedom of speech and freedom of information. I'm not speaking only about the punitive uh, and uh, dictatorial uh, character of, of the Kiev regime. I am speaking about the situation when any any truth that you are trying to promote, any any other different opinion that you're trying to promote now about the situation in Ukraine or even the situation in Gaza is immediately being labeled as, as Russian propaganda. You are being labeled as a conspiracy theorist and a Putin apologist and whatever, you name it. It means that th there is absolutely clear censorship uh, in the West for any information that is different from the official narrative. This is something that reminds me of the worst worst uh, times of the Soviet Union, uh, when there was only one opinion, and uh, every, any other opinion was absolutely illegal. So the West is very close to this situation, and this is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. That's why so many people uh, right now at the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis have been reaching out to us, to me personally, saying that they don't have any platform to, uh, to express their views, to promote their opinion, to defend their position. And that's why a lot of uh, independent uh, journalists, experts, used our invitation to speak uh, before the Security Council uh, during official meetings. And they promoted very important facts, important information, because Security Council so far remains maybe one of very few uh, platforms uh, which is totally uncensored, where n nothing that we would say is being censored or being distorted or tempered or doctored so we are it's our direct speech we can we can bring uh forward our position we may be criticized for this but at least we want we can say whatever we uh, want to say and this position is being archived and it is being accessible to everybody everything else is very questionable and in many situations it can it can be risky for those people who are uh, trying to to speak the truth to uh, to challenge the the public narrative, it can be very risky for them. And well, let's remember uh, Gonzalo Lira, the U.S. citizen who is being detained by a Kiev regime right now, and the U.S. is not doing anything to to save this the, this brave man. 
so it can happen to anybody and everybody. And uh, a lot of people, by the way, uh, a lot of foreigners are um, seeking asylum in Russia right now. And uh, it's not uh, in tens, it's in hundreds, and if not in thousands of people who are trying to, to get asylum in Russia and who are saying that they feel more safe, more free in Russia in expressing their opinion and uh, in uh, they're, they're not they're not uh, fearful of their of their life uh, and their dignity in my country and that's a very good sign for me and uh, but very bad sign for for the west well thank you again for your time thank it will you. be very much appreciated so uh, yeah i understand you have a meeting there at the un security council quite soon thank so you guys we'll let you go exactly thank you so much exactly <clears throat> thank you very much thank you take care bye